Hi everyone. So this is tutorial for your presentation number two. There are only two of them. Uh, so a little glimpse of what it is to be an economist in the real world. And the second one will be about value of money. In some ways it's easy because you only have three indicators that you by now should know to present three prices of money out of four. So the fourth one is to advance. So we just focus on three things that uh, should know. We got exchange rates. So, uh, three prices of money. We will build three graphs uh, for your country. So, again, everything for the same country as you did with the one, but the United States, and the country will go. And your goal is to understand the value of money, what's happening with the financial system of your country. A long last 10, 15 years, ideally would be to find data in years, to have an eight because that was for the financial crisis time. It's interesting to see how each country uh, responded. And, but if there is no data, that's fine. And in other countries, sometimes this, at least 10 years should be there. So your goal is to understand in each period of time, so let's say 25 years, when was the peak, when the money of your country had the best shape, the greatest value, where they all, so all three markets, are independent, but they are talking to each other. As you could, I, I was talking about apples, Whole Foods, Costco, Ireland, US. So they talk to each other, but not first, not immediately, and second, not always. And quite often there is a conflict, especially between things like uh, and between all. So exchange rates are external. For example, for US, there's a big kind of disconnect between exchange rates and interest rates because US policy of the Federal Reserve is ignoring exchange rates. And in the world only, so we have the United States with dollar, we have the European Central Bank with Euro, so I wouldn't call six countries because European Union is not a country, but European Union and five countries are the only one that can be ignored more or less. But truly ignored, it's only United States and European Union. So uh, there's two currencies, Euro and US, that are so powerful that they can ignore the exchange rate. Uh, and build only sort of internal policy. So for both of them, interest rates are the most important sort of market. They look at interest rate, inflation too, especially this year, but interest rates are even more important because the demand for money for the US dollar globally and for Europe comes from businesses mostly, not from people. Because yes, internally it comes from people. But if you look, let's say US dollar, we have demand for US dollar within United States from people. Makes sense. We trade, we buy things, we need money. Then we have demand for US dollar from investors in United States, which are almost the same and actually even more because we use a lot of credit cards to pay for things, so we don't need money. That's a different story, a bit more complicated, but as I mentioned before, banks with credit cards, they don't use dollars, they don't need money, they just use credit. And it's an alternative to money. So demand from consumers, from people, is actually pretty low. Demand from investors within the US is high. But there is a matching amount or even sometimes larger amount of demand for US dollars outside from us. 
from investors. Could not consumers, right? Consumers don't need those. But investors that are in Ukraine, Holland, Argentina, Japan, China, everywhere they need US dollar. So there is demand for that. And that's why uh, interest rate is the most important because they go to banks, banks go to US banks, and so banks mostly fuel and satisfy that demand for money. So there is a great amount of dollars uh, on this market than on any other market. Exchange rate is mostly for consumers and uh, kind of business consumers for operations. So there is a huge demand there as well, but US and European Union can ignore that because of this investment market within them. So there is a significant demand for those currencies anyway, whatever the exchange rate is. Uh, it's much easier for, for those kind of for European Union and US to run monetary policy. Because if you take any other country, so then there are kind of following countries. So there's Japan, there's Australia, Canada, and Switzerland. And those countries have pretty good currency. That uh, pretty good economy in general. Most of them are, as we study trade, this uh, uh, also makes sense to really to understand that exchange rate in this market is influenced by trade about 80% of the market is about trade, if not more. Which means that if a country has good trade balance, then it's at least in this market, the currency is good. And Japan, Australia, Canada, and Switzerland, all of them have very good export import balance. So we, we, we don't know what would happen, let's say, to those currencies if they had bad trade. US has a pretty bad trade, but very strong currency. And one of the things uh, that you will talk about and problems with uh, trade now is that US dollar, or US United States is actually exporting US dollars. Otherwise, it's impossible to explain what's going on because we run a massive, almost 30 year trade deficit that is unsustainable in any economic terms for any other country that would collapse, collapse the economy in the country. And yet, we are actually running that kind of conflict. And so, for some time, economists were worried about this trade deficit. Some of them are still worried. And then, if, you know, we can worry, worry, but it's 30 years already. So after some time, other economists realize that there is nothing to worry about. Because, well, there are things to worry about, but not in a way that we're going to have a destroyed economy. Because we are experts in US dollar. Because every other country, every other business section around the world, and many people around the world need dollars for their savings, for their mostly savings, but also trade operations. And that's a product, not just currency as we use, let's say, uh, Brazilian real. That is not used globally as anything except buy stuff from Brazil. Dollars are not like that. Every other country, actually every country in the world, use some amount of dollars for savings, and a lot of dollars for investments, and for trade. So similar with Europe, but to less extent. And that's why U.S. is expert in dollars for those purposes. It's a service to the world, but as you should have already know from the previous uh, week, as a result of Second World War in Bretton Woods. But it shouldn't count as, as, as it's counted right now. So we have like a trade deficit, and then we have dollars sort of disconnected. If we add dollars as a service or as a good that the United States supplies the world, then our trade deficit is not that deficit. And there is a, you know, 
dilemma for economists because it's sort of we're providing that to the world, but it, at the same time, it's our own currency that has this inflation and interest rate markets. And right now, for example, they're not doing great. So there is like disconnect because it's the same dollar, but it also means we have an international service and then we have local balances. It's hard for the United States, but it's also easier because for so we have US dollar, we have Euro, two completely independent on exchange rate, extremely powerful currencies. Then we have Japan, Japanese yen, uh, Australian Canadian dollars, and Swiss franc. Those four are the kind of following powerful currencies that are de facto also independent on exchange rate. Right? But mostly because their trade is also so good. So in you know, Europe and US, even trade could be bad, good, doesn't doesn't affect the exchange rate that much. For those four, we don't know, but because they're quite small relatively to so, uh, United States and European Union. So it might not be that good, but the reality is that their trade is constantly very good, the economies are very good as well. And so their currencies are very good and they, they're not bothered that much with exchange. For all other countries, out of free market exchange rate is the most important one. Because if something happens there, it's, it's impossible to fix. It's a global market, the exchange rate market, is beyond national control. Neither even the United States cannot really influence. They don't care, but they cannot influence. Countries, you got Brazil, Ukraine, Vietnam, uh, whatever countries in the world that are not listed, European Union, US, and for foreign countries, they bother. Exchange rate is dominant for them. And so they need to maintain certain trade balance to have exchange rate strong and we can see that every time there is a problem with trade this problem with exchange rate there is automatically problems on other markets so different countries different priorities of a central bank that's what you need to capture with your uh data analysis. So you, you have a country, you, have, you will have three graphs, but you need to write a really good analysis. And like, okay, the exchange rate, and you'll see exchange rate graphs are kind of the hardest to actually read. So you gotta be very careful. I suggest to uh, make it in a way that when you know, it increase, uh, means your currency gets stronger, decrease your currency gets weaker. Uh, but the convent, or you can use the conventional sort of two alternatives. You can use the conventional exchange rate and then explain to everybody who watches, listeners, that what it means to go up and down on the graph. So let's jump right into it and we'll see. So this is trading economics. Dot com. It actually is, uh, we used it before, but it's designed to trade uh, currencies. So it's really good for Forex. That is the market for trading currencies. So here's basic things about exchange rates. There are always two, right? Let's say first Euro, USD. We can have an exchange rate, let's click. So this one is how, so there is a convention, let's go. Conventional is right here. That's a conventional for each pair of currencies. Conventional means someone, the market players selected, which would be the base, which would be the change of currency. Because for every currency, you can see how many euros for one dollar and how many dollars for one euro. Those are two different exchange rates, obviously inverted. One is inverted, the other. But mathematically, they're inverted. However, they're different. They're different numbers, different meaning. If 
if we have, so the convention of a euro USD is how many dollars for one euro? Why? Whatever, convention. It doesn't have any reason. Some reasoning, usually, you know, if you study it, you can go find ex uh, exceptions right away. But the general idea is that the number should be more than one. So if you have two currencies, uh, if they're not very close to each other, you will have, let's say, Japanese yen is one of the most uh, reasons. So Japanese yen, it's how many yen for one dollar, USD, GPY. It's 134 today, so 134 yen for one US dollar. If it was the opposite, that would be 0, 0.0 something. It's not very convenient to look at it and to operate with these numbers. So that's a bit explanation for convention. Same with Chinese. Uh, Chinese currency is 6.7. So if we invert, that's going to be like 10 cents, not very useful. However, we have exceptions with Australian dollar and New Zealand dollar kind of right away because it's how many Australian dollars for one US dollar and not how many US dollars. Oh, no, actually, sorry. So it's how many US dollars for one Australian. Why? I don't know. Especially considering that Canada, so Australia, Canada, they're both part of, part of Commonwealth British. So they're very similar in many ways. And yet you have Australian dollar, how many dollars? So 70 cents, 70 American cents for one Australian dollar. And then you go to USD, Can, Canadian, it's 128 Canadian dollars for one US dollar. So you can see they're also inverted here. It's IUD, USD, USD, CAD. So that kind of indicates you. Uh, in other class, we look into exchange rates quite a lot in money and banking, international finance, you know how to calculate it. It's, it's all not necessary for macroeconomics. Macroeconomics, you just need to understand basic. Well, to exchange rate for every pair of currencies. So there is one convention. So let's use um, USD. So a few things. When we talk about your country, if we have this graph, we can click 25 years. Uh, if you, you cannot have one graph for currency. You cannot have analyze just this pair because it doesn't tell you which, so it's a pair of currency, Europe, European Union, and United States. Okay, we can see clearly there is, let's say, increase. First, first thing first, figure out what, what this means. So, because it's how many dollars for one euro, this means devaluation of US dollar. Because it's, it was one point, at this lowest point was 85 US cents for one euro. That's after it started. Then it was a strong, strong increase because there was great faith in euro, actually becoming part of US dollar as a global currency. Plus, after 2007 and uh, peak 2008, here US was doing pretty crazy monetary policy during the good times, which kind of strange. So US dollar was losing its value over other currencies. And, and then 2008, we see Euro actually in 2014 with Greece and 2012, the well, Euro got weaker and weaker, not really picked up after a little, some good moments, but now it's actually going down again to one. 105. It's kind of crazy. Uh, good for me traveling from the US to Ireland, but uh, overall not very good for you. Oh, 
Good. So as I mentioned, countries like European Union doesn't really care about that that much. So it's good for like travelers and trade, but because US and Europe Union of such massive economic systems that US is not balanced with trade, but European Union is pretty balanced with trade. So it doesn't really affect that. Even this drop, like significant, still not really that much. So because there are positive and negative impacts. So it's, um, positive because European products are cheaper, so it's cheaper for to trade them around the world. That's positive, negative, but wages are lower compared to, let's say, US wages. So traveling for people is harder from Europe to US, but mostly it's wages. So it's like an ability to buy stuff decreases, and that's where the size matters because European Union is so large that there's so many countries producing goods that most products are local and because they're mostly local this is not that impactful a smaller country usually if it's small countries quite successful economically it also means it's very integrated about 60 or more percent of its economy is export import so if if it goes down everything imported becomes significantly high, it's harder to run business. Uh, even though your products is easier to sell, it's much harder to produce them. And any disruption is bad, basically. Any disruption is so, net impact is varies from country to country, but disruption itself is bad. And that's what we have with COVID now, um, quite a disruption. So we see that even Sometimes you win, sometimes, or rather, some companies win, some companies lose. But on macro level, it's just the fact of disruption. The disruption is not great. But what we cannot say from this graph alone is that, okay, we can see the significant kind of weakening of dollar against euro and then. Reverse. We cannot conclude from one line whether for which movement dollar is responsible and for which movement is euro responsible. It's impossible. Let's say this job was something bad happening in uh, Europe or something extremely great happening in the United States. So questionable because it's not but very great to again disruption it's a massive disruption for us dollar getting significantly stronger like it's a positive thing for wages and many things but it's a disruption that will hurt exporters and that's why disruption any disruption any movement exchange actually exchange rate ideal exchange rate flatline that's that's our ideal uh, because again, disruption is, is, is bad. Uh, even though an aggregate could be good sides, bad sides, could be winners, losers, but you cannot be the straight line. That's why gold was so good. Gold is just automatically a straight line. However, so we cannot say what happened here. Right. Is it euro or US dollar? Is it here, it's euro or US dollar? That's why we need, we need to add, uh, let's say, uh, probably, yeah, that's not very helpful. Well, the idea is right, but it's very hard to read, so let's not add this one. That's at uh, yeah, All right. So I add British pound to US dollars. So careful why Japanese yen didn't work out because it's how many euros for one dollar 
and how many dollars, uh, no, how many dollars for one euro and how many Japanese yen for one dollar. They invert it. And so what you see in the graph, when one goes down, the other goes up if the dollar is the cause of movement, which is very, so what you try to do is to find a pair that are the same direction. So it's USD in the end, USD in the end, like a blank, obvious thing which means how many dollars for one euro, how many dollars for one British pound. And now with a pair, you can clearly see a few things. When they are moving in one direction, so British pound again may be not the best because it's affected by euro significantly, right? But still you can see when they're moving together, that is because of dollar. Because if the problem is in US and the problem is with the United States, it will affect pounds in Europe. If the problem is with the Euro, it will affect only US the Euro on this graph. It will not affect British pound. So again, that's why pound is not good because it's also in, in Europe and it's likely to be affected. So let's choose Australia. And let's teach the British pound. Now let's move to 25. Yeah, that's much better. So you can see here when they move along the movement, that means the responsible for that movement is US dollar. And you can see everything here until 2008 and slightly after that is actually the response of US dollar. So US dollar will get weaker, get stronger. It's all US dollar. It's nothing from the Euro side actually responsible for that movement or for Australia. However, here you can see clearly that even though the movement kind of similar, it's got diverged. This means that Euro got in trouble. Euro got in trouble. Right here, it sort of devaluates, but not here. And not in Australian dollar. So Australian dollar is still strong. And oh wait, oh, actually no, it's Australian dollar. And then, got here. so yeah, there was some problem with Australian dollar. But anyway, they're moving differently, right? This goes down, stronger this. So this part is Australia, this part is, nothing happens to US dollar, that's the thing. When they go different directions, uh, that means other side. And so when you analyze your country, you are trying to find this, Try, try to find something that happened in your country that is causing the exchange rate. And overall, if we talk about US dollar, what we can talk about trends and peaks. So we end today. So we can start from today. So in both cases, it's how many of US dollar per other currency. Right? How many dollars per other currency? So more dollars, not good. Less dollars, good. In, in general, good is flat line, but if we prefer to say something, so this period really not good, and then getting better and better. So what we see now, now US dollar is actually pretty strong despite us having inflation and it looks like if you're in the united states it looks like everything's so bad financially he, it's all relative that's important to remember the world is relative and that's why in economics we always as i told, told you in the very beginning never use absolute statements they are there completely useless we always have to compare either other countries or in time. We can say today, economic situation in the US is a bit harder than five years ago. We can say that. We also can say that today, US dollar, that we can clearly say US dollar today is doing much better than Euro. 
and a little bit better than Australian dollar. So, uh, despite inflation, so you would see people, yeah, those who just live in the US, would see, oh, it's so bad, the property US dollar is just like losing its value. And that's why those, some of you wrote in some discussion that uh, US dollar is losing its value. No, it's not. So that's wrong. That's why you study, not just uh, you know, use your common knowledge for what you get from uh, various TV or whatever you get it. That's not academic. You need to study economics and use economic knowledge. We got three markets. When we say US is losing value, we only reflect it to exchange rate. That's a common language. If we say devaluation of in particular inflation, devaluation of US dollar, where is devaluation? We see a strong appreciation of US dollar against Euro and a little bit against Australian dollar. So that uh, not happened. We have strong dollar. Yes, that's because now we can see five, five years ago, Perhaps dollar was in a bit better position, obviously, because before COVID, before uh, we see inflation and all the challenges, yeah, it was it was better before. However, uh, how other countries deal with it? That's another thing. Other countries have also problems, and that's how we live. We live in the relative world. And relatively, US dollar today is doing pretty good in the exchange. Now we can add back Japanese yen because that's the uh, that's from the other world, right? We have only three major districts. We have Europe, US, and Asia. And if you want to see what's in Asia. You gotta look at Japanese yen, and but that's why I added later. So you understand that this increase in Japanese yen is same as this decrease. It's not the opposite because it's how many Japanese yen per one dollar, and this how many dollars per one currency. So the amount of dollars decrease for euro and for Australian dollar, but. It increased the amount of yen increased for dollar, which only can, uh, confirms what we had here that US dollar globally is getting stronger today and really significantly stronger. So you can see massive increase here means more Japanese yen for US dollar. Here it means uh, less dollars for other currency. But if we invert this too, by being where this it can all be online. So that's why for like a, a economist from academic perspective, this conventional exchange rate is just a nightmare. Because what you want from academic is all normal, like lines in one direction moving. So you can see the picture and say, okay, this is dollar appreciation, this is for depreciation, everything is kind of smooth. However, and that's not reality. I tried to teach you a little bit of reality. So what you would do is copy this graph. You can try to export. Sometimes they charge you if they want to charge you. So what you do is just save picture or you can print screen it into uh, your Word document or your presentation, um, PPT. And then you write a comment, write what you see, and you write, okay, what this market, what happens here? What happens with your currency 25 years ideally? So again, try to use just two lines is enough. You can again see distortion, but it Again, it's the same moment. Decrease here is equivalent to increase. So it's, it's dollar getting weaker. weaker. And then reverse after the dollar. So you copy graph, write completely. Then other two are a little bit easier because you don't need 
many. You just need one. And the other two, so if you go to the United States, we need inflation rate and we need interest rate. And we have both. Well, we can technically put them in one graph. They're usually quite comparable. So, yeah, instead of three graphs, we have two graphs. That's in the more interesting if you can manage that. So this is my effects for the rate, it's interest rate. I want the mass. Inflation rate. That should work. Yeah. Now it does. So with currency, you can you saw how good it is because this database itself is designed primary to trade currency. So it's much better there. Here it's not ideal because you see left side and right side uh, side axis. So they're not matched. This is zero, and this is zero here. So luckily they do move in one direction because it's interest rate and inflation. The graph itself is not really helpful. Uh, so that's why you can either choose this one graph, but if you can really explain it very well and understand, it's not that true. Because again, this is inflation, this is interest rate scale. So let's say this point is, 6.5, however, on this scale, 6.5 is somewhere here. Not that, I think the negative numbers make it hard because you have deflation here, plus 2008, and you had almost zero here. And this is where we are, this, that's our problem. And you can see we had a record increase of, interest rates, even though not comparable to inflation. So we have, that's a big issue I asked last time uh, about US, what to do it. Hopefully I haven't checked yet the answers, but we did good. And again, it's not political, it kind of look deeper. We have real significant problems with our production lines. And that's, uh, by the way, you will have a discussion. So this week, mostly about trade, we have two chapters, but trade chapter is very kind of extensive. And the result, the inflation we have is because we have problems with trade, in particular with Asian countries like China and Taiwan, a little bit. So we have China, a lot of problems. But now the problems you hear the news. That's a big uh, kind of little side note about the uh, uh, discussion. We have problems that we don't have trade with China. It seems like problem appear that, oh, we trade too much with China. And so now the problem now, the massive problem is that we we don't trade with China, we use to trade with China. And there are many layers to that problem because, because of Russia, we see that trading with country that has hostile political intention is not good. So everyone, you know, Russia was quite a big economy. Everyone who invested in Russia from the West lost everything in one day, basically. Some tried to stick up, but by now, 100 plus days more, everything's lost. No, no, I don't know any company that still has hope for running business in Russia. So that could happen in China. That's in way worse. So now we can see, well, it's, it's cheaper to produce, especially in yeah. So in Russia, it's mostly for oil and gas or for selling stuff to locals. But in China, we, we that's the global production 
place as a global factor. If something happens like that, the world, not just the US, but the world has nowhere to produce because we got accustomed to this. So now we need to rethink the trust because of the war. We need to rethink, well, if we have such political differences, but we rely so much on producing those countries, particularly in China, but what's going to be without it? But even before the war got pandemic and difference in response to pandemic, if you don't know, I don't know how you don't know, but China uh, doesn't have vaccines and basically the Western response where we had lockdowns and basically lockdowns sometimes, but we had temporary lockdowns and we have vaccines and now we're fully open and no one cares about COVID anymore. Even if COVID numbers go up, they say, well, we have a choice, you vaccinated, you choose not to, that's your problem. If you vaccinated, you say, it seems to be all right. We'll take the risk, but we need economy to run. China had completely different response. They do not trust vaccines. Well, they do not accept vaccines from the West. They couldn't develop their own. That is effective, which result them in what's called zero COVID policy. So they have massive lockdowns if there is just one case. And that's what they did with Shanghai recently. And everyone is watching sharp. But from economic perspective, it's, it's massive implications because they do not do their part of the global economy. And now we have problems in inflation because China produced everything cheaply. Now we have painful choice. We either try to back China basically to stop doing this other things and start working as before to all good old days. But uh, there are ma many problems with that. We never talk about uh, problems with international Or well, we should uh, start building somewhere else our production facility, for example, back in the United States and Europe. Well, guess what? That inflation never stop because it's going to cost more. Realistically, we, we make things in China because they're extremely cheap. Yes, we can make things in Vietnam or Laos or some, some Latin American countries to Uruguay. They're going to be cheap, but that's a massive movement to another country. So that's one option, maybe some African countries. But there was a reason why everything was made in China. It was internal political stability and extremely low wages and extremely loose environmental and other regulations. You can do what you want. Not many countries left like that. And because China also is so massive, even if you try to move out from China to somewhere, let's say you move from China to Vietnam, Vietnam is pretty good in all those categories. Well, you cannot move the entire Chinese economy to Vietnam because it's, even though Vietnam is not a small country, it's not China. So it's going to go up. The prices go up, the wages go up, and inflation. So we have serious problems with outlook the future. But it doesn't mean, you know, there is always a positive side because what it means we'll have jobs and a bit better quality of producing in with your local production. And many people see that as a good thing. So that's why studying economics is important. Because what I see from kind of people who don't study economics, don't even understand, is they're protesting opposite things. Let's say, no, everyone hates inflation. A year ago, half year ago, or even now, right now, they always they also protest that there are no jobs in the United States and everything was moved to, uh, to China and Mexico and other places. Those are opposite things. You cannot have jobs in the US and not have inflation. Well, not have prices. Inflation is kind of a process, but 
at least one time price increase. That's reality. That's why we had no inflation. Everything was so cheap and made in China. Now it's not made in China. We have inflation. We can get out of it by creating jobs here, creating jobs in other place, or persuading China to get back to pre-COVID relationship. And in neither of those, we are doing very good because we are not really, we don't have a really good relationship with China, uh, which is not great. So if you actually want inflation to reduce fast, that's the option. Persuade China to that you are great friends and that's going to pre-COVID uh, situation uh, they produce, we consume, it's great, well, great, uh, it's not that great, but it's cheap. So, if you want specific inflation, well, that's the solution. Now, there was an, another problem with jobs, so uh, that problem will get stronger. You want to solve that problem, well, it's going to be inflation because. You cannot make products in the US and Europe on costs that are made in China. That's why it's all as it is now. So that's a little glimpse to today's topic of uh, problems with international trade. About here, same thing, you copy the graph. Uh, I would probably, in this case, but, so it depends how your graph looks. You can see it's rather disconnected here, so it's a bit harder to see interest rate go down. Right here, we do have a little decrease of inflation, then have increase in interest rate and inflation. So then drop of both and first drop. So we important this time for this to so these two markets in neoclassical setup are mathematically correct. And the graph in reality shows that while they are moving mostly in one direction because of monetary policy, they're not aligning time. Which, you know, if I tell you, okay, inflation is going to be about 2% two years from now, how will that help you right now with gas prices? But so on. not really. But, you know, 20 years from now, some of the students will look at this and see why they were so concerned. You see the inflation kind of spike, and like something like here, it went down. But same idea. Oh, it went down, or the interest rate sharply went down. So what? Inflation went down too, and then everything came back. So this took a while, but something like this. So timing matters a lot. What happened here, clearly, as we all know from other sources, but you can see in the graph, a massive drop in interest rate first because of economic crisis. And then a few months later, the real economic collapse, because there's financial economic collapse, a few months, real economic collapse. So timing matters. Here, we have a massive, again, crisis, financial problems with decrease in interest rate. So decrease of interest rate from uh, well, again, interest rate by about 3%, so about 3% here, 3-4%, and before it's speaking, 4% sort of historical norm. So if you're above 4%, it's a problem. If you're below 4%, it's a problem. What happened here, it's like a old problem with a new problem. So not some good terms. Now, if you're below three, four percent, now you look at inflation. If your inflation is this, she uh, is about two percent, and you're at zero, that's a problem. So, if you're from your chapter, from that neoclassical setup, you should know that interest rate should always be higher than inflation because interest rate minus inflation is how much money you make in the economy. Well, this is the government basically it's the interest rate. So the interest, there are many interest rates. This particular interest rate is the Federal Reserve 
Federal Reserve funds rates, so it's Federal Reserve giving money to banks and government on this rate. Now, mostly to banks and government usually have the same rate with their government bonds. But so that's like the lowest rate. Still, this rate should be at least equal to inflation because if it's equal, so interest rate minus inflation equal to what's called the real return. So let's say real return right here is negative. And that's a big problem for last decade that real returns not only in US, in many countries, in Germany, in Japan, they're negative. It's just no one is making money uh, on this low risk assets. And it's quite confusing uh, things. And, uh, I think I'm gonna make much a video about it. I'm not sure, but nevertheless, that's what it should be. So what you look at is exchange rate, uh, interest rate higher than inflation. That's a good period. So again, graph is not aligned, but look at 2%. So this is 2%, this is 2%. So this is two. Okay, this were good times. We generally think that between 2002 and 2008, there were good times. So this went to five, this went to two. So here were a little bit of troubles to 2007, but overall not. Here was, that's the most confusing period in monetary history while we learn all these new things that I'm telling you, because that's impossible like from their classical setup. That's impossible. You have zero, flat zero interest rate and then you have inflation jumping all around, but you cannot have interest rate less than inflation. That's that's what collapsed into something. It just doesn't make any sense. And as you can see, we had it for a very long time, and we still have, especially with inflation today. So that means our economy operates with kind of it's like running business. It doesn't make any money, but keep on running business. And everyone seems okay. With that. And there are many fundamental. So it's, even though it's just like graphic number, there's under, under that, because it's impossible. Like this graph is straight, like there is no gravity. When you start digging, why is that happening? And then we uncover a lot of other things. What we started for this one again, copy graph explain how your current uh, currency, how your money of your country is doing with inflation. Luckily for you, most other countries, because of this massive impact of exchange rate, they actually more alike. So we have like a time where exchange rate. Uh, so your currency devaluates whatever the direction of your graph is. Uh, let's say it's down, right? Your currency go on down. This means inflation go up and exchange interest rates go up. So, so mostly you will see a more aligned situation uh, within three markets in most countries. US is the most popular place. Euro is also like that. And again, those four countries are a bit aligned they could be different, but they're all good. So currency is good, inflation is good, interest rate is good. And, and then from there you go whatever country is with a very different situation. So that's it. You basically put graphs, copy graphs uh, in PowerPoint and write explanation. All right. And that's it.